Good evening and welcome. I'm Malcolm Daniel. I'm Gosson Lindell Wortham Curator of Photography here at the museum. Thrilled to see uh, so many of you here. I hope, uh, I hope that you've had a chance already to, uh, to visit the exhibition on the second floor of this building, Sally Mam of Thousand Crossings. If not, um, or um, if, as I hope, you feel compelled to have a second or third or fourth look at the show, um, it continues uh, on view until May 27th. Um, it's a great uh, pleasure to welcome Sarah Greeno. Sarah is uh, senior curator and head of the Department of Photographs at the National Gallery of Art in Washington. She joined the gallery in 1978 as a Samuel Cress Fellow, and she never left. Um, and so uh, in 1990, she became the founding curator of the Department of Photographs, and she's built a world-class collection um, at the gallery that spans the medium's history from its earliest days to the present. Um, and she has curated uh, a long string of groundbreaking exhibitions, many of them accompanied by award-winning catalogs. Her exhibitions and publications range from um, 19th century British photography to American snapshots to uh, the work of major artists that include Irving Penn and Gary Winogrand, Robert Frank, Andre Kertes, um, and others. And particularly noteworthy is her work on Alfred Stieglitz, whose key set of prints is at the gallery. Um, and Stieglitz's artistic circle and his relationship with Georgia O'Keeffe. Um, those publications are all essential references in our field. I've had the really good fortune to call Sarah Greeno a friend and a colleague for many years. We've collaborated um, on a number of exhibitions. And so when um, Sarah uh, contacted me to say that she and Sarah Kennel uh, were thinking about organizing a Sally Mann exhibition um, and to ask whether Houston might be interested in being part of the tour, I jumped at the chance. Um, because, of course, I knew the quality of Sally Mann's work, but I also knew that the two Sarahs um, and the National Gallery would produce a really smart and meaningful exhibition and a really beautiful catalog, which I recommend to you, available in the MFAH shop, of course. Um, tonight, uh, Sarah will speak about man's photography and its relationship to uh, her deep interest in literature and also to her own uh, brilliant and poetic writing. So please join me in welcoming Sarah Greeno. Uh, good evening, um, everyone. It's, um, it's a great pleasure to, to be here. Um, and it's really a great pleasure to see the, the Sally Mann exhibition installed so beautifully here. Um, I've often remarked that organizing an exhibition is a little bit like, like raising a child. Um, you hope you instill the right values in it, um, but once they go out on the road, you really don't know um, who or what they are going to, um, to encounter. Um, and the show looks really, really fabulous here. So um, it's, it's, it's an immense pleasure. Um, I want to talk tonight, as Malcolm said, about um, Sally's relationship between her um, visual images, her photographs, um, and also um, her interest um, in writing. But begin with a, with a little prelude. In, in September of 1979, the Edwin Houck Gallery in New York opened an exhibition of photographs by Sally Mann that was titled Motherland, Recent Landscapes of Georgia and Virginia. The show included two groups of pictures all made in the last four years and each group seemingly quite different from the other. Those made in Virginia are of the rolling hills, rivers, and vine-encrusted forests near Mann's family home in Lexington, Virginia. And they um, are dark and <coughs> dense pictures that, that shimmer with an almost palpable, moisture-laden atmosphere. And they also exude this deep sense um, of familiarity as if they're the result of years of looking and thinking about the landscape. Those made in Georgia 
are largely of nondescript buildings and empty fields and seem as if the photographer had encountered an entirely foreign land. Bright and even blasted in appearance, they adhere to few traditional notions of beauty and instead display an evidence of damage to the negative's emulsion. Whereas the pictures in Virginia are redolent of personal connections, those made in Georgia seem to allude to a larger national history of war, death, suffering, and injustice. These bold but disparate photographs really succinctly express, I think, the transitional nature of man's art at the time. With no people in sight, they're also a significant departure for the artist who for the past several years had been embroiled in controversy around her earlier body um, of work, immediate family. Made between 1984 and 1991, the photographs in immediate family depict her three young children, Emmett, obviously in the middle, um, Virginia, the youngest, um, and, uh, and Jesse, occasionally nude um, and sometimes accompanied by her husband, Larry, at the family's remote summer cabin on the Maori River in Virginia. Fully exploiting photography's descriptive capabilities, the lush pictures show the traditional pastime of childhood, swimming, dressing up, reading the funnies, vamping for the camera as well as the minor incidents of everyday life, nose bleeds, bug bites, cuts and scrapes. Yet with their seductive undertones and occasionally provocative images, they're also startling, psychologically charged and infused with a dark, darker undercurrent or undercurrents, um, latent sexuality, injury um, and even death. The publication of Immediate Family in 1992 swept man up into the culture wars of the 1990s and the national debate about child pornography, uh, motherhood and government support of the arts and censorship that tore through an increasingly polarized societies. Supporters were quick to, um, uh, to commend and champion the refreshing honesty of man's vision, noting that it was an accurate and a welcome corrective to the familiar notions of youth as a time of unalloyed sweetness and innocence. And they praised Immediate Family as one of the great photography books of our time, a singularly powerful uh, evocation of childhood. But critics condemned it, deploring its selling um, of photographs of children in their nakedness um, as an exploitation of the parental role. Mann herself felt blindsided um, and battered by the controversy, to use her words, and in the early 1990s, slowly turned away from photographing her children to recording the landscape behind them explaining to a friend in 1994 that the kids seemed to be disappearing from the image, receding into the landscape. Yet supporters and critics alike were perplexed by, in the late 1990s by these new photographs. Applauding their daring originality, some perceptively noted how easy it would have been for man to continue to photograph her children and commended her for not falling into the trap of endlessly repeating the same kind of picture. Knowing of the legal threat faced by some photographers at, this, at that time, others warned if she had been censored or so scared by her previous experiences that she had succumbed to self-censorship. Hilton Alls, in a perceptive but critical review in The New Yorker, chided Mann for being too obsessed with the South's picture per postcard, terrible beauty. Rather than enjoying one of photography's most liberating qualities, its freedom from language, Mann begs for verbalization. He concluded, she wants to be a mythologizer, a Faulkner of the lens. Manway may well have agreed, at least in part, 
with this assessment. From the beginning of her career, she has laid claim to her Southern heritage and asserted that her work is Southern, and it can be seen in her obsession with place, with family, with both the personal and social path, past, the susceptibility to myth, the love of this light, as she said, which is all our own, and the readiness to experiment with dosage of romance that would be fatal to most 20th century artists. But she has also been equally clear that literature has been just as important to her, her art, noting that she always wanted to reconcile being a writer and being a photographer. She was an avid reader um, as, a, as a child, and she has said that she imbibed her father's belief that television was not just stupid, but possibly evil, <laughs> and her mother's utter devotion to, to her belief that books and reading mattered, mattered more, as Sally said, than getting home at supper time to be there with a casserole between her oven mitts. Also, she frequently admitted that she was never trained as a photographer, but stumbled into the profession. Um, she, instead, she received a master's degree in creative writing from Holland's College and only became a photographer in the 1970s because it was easier than writing, and she was able to find a job as a photographer at a local university. Moreover, she never sought to create an art that was free from language. Joining her literary taste with her aesthetic vision, she explained the two sensibilities, the visual and the verbal, has, have always been linked for me. In fact, while reading a particularly evocative passage, I imagine the photograph I'd take of that scene, what it might look like, even with dodging and burning notes. As she wrote her award-winning uh, 2015 uh, memoir, Hold Still, she said, the inherent relationship between my writing and photography has never been clearer to me than it is now. If I couldn't do justice with words in my writing, and certainly not just the facts, ma'am, kind, I tried with my camera, composing silver poems of tone and undertow the imagery saturated with the words of the authors I read in my teenage years, Faulkner, Whitman, Merwin, and Rilke. Many of my poem photographs, she continued, would sing those words, heady with beauty, ponderous with loss, right back to them. Yet her love of literature did more than just inform her imagery. It also permeated both the means she explored to create her art and her aspirations for it. Although she embraced a medium, photography, that for much of its existence was inextricably linked to the reproduction of reality, she has never aspired to be a documentary photographer um, and exa with exactitude in her pictures, but has always sought to do more than simply record what she sees. From her first pictures made in the late 1960s and early 1970s to those from nearly 50 years later, she has always skirted the border between fact and fiction, the real and the imagined. By staging tableaus, altering and manipulating her negatives, and courting the vagaries of chance, she has repeatedly inserted herself between her subjects and its expression. Recognizing that the power of fiction to speak to the human condition lies in its proximity to, as well as its distance from the world, she has consistently deconstructed familiar vistas, vistas in order to posit new ways of seeing the everyday. With her deep understanding of the power of narrative and metaphor, she has recognized how her pictures can take on the psychological intensity and moral ambiguity of a short story, the nuanced complexity and immersive emotional sweep of a novel, and the lyric resonance and exalted cultural significance of an epic verse. In the rest of my time this evening, I'd like to show how this has been Sally Mann's aim, to construct silver, poem, silver poems of tone and undertow, 
elegies to both the fraught heritage of her southern homeland, its history, identity, race, and religion, and the overarching themes of existence, the bonds of family, memory, desire, and death. Sally Mann began to photograph in 1969 while she was a senior in high school. Although she studied literature and creative writing in college and graduate school, she also continued to explore photography by attending several workshops around the country, including one taught by Ansel Adams. Adams' uh, impact on Sally Mann's early landscape photographs made around her home in Lexington is obvious, but the difference between their work is telling, too. Even though she started with these pictures um, made in the early 70s to use a larger view camera than you saw in that picture of her before, a 5 by 7 inch view camera as advocated by Ansel Adams, her pictures are softer and more suggestive than those by the older photographer, more concerned with an eastern and specifically southern quality of light more focused on the fragile nature of the vistas in front of her camera and more suggestive of the human presence within the landscape. Mann's life and art changed profoundly and permanently in the late 1970s and early 1980s when she and her husband had three children in quick succession, Emmett, Jesse, and Virginia. Their very presence turned her focus away from the abstract or the poetic to the people around her. As she now sought to create, as she wrote, visual stories that made people think, she looked to the work of her friend and mentor, Emmett Gowan. Gowan was born in nearby Danville, Virginia, and he had made quietly insightful poetic pictures throughout the 1960s and 70s of his wife and her extended family in Danville, often employing fecund symbols and often using an 8 by 10 inch view camera with a lens that was too small for it, um, so that created this vignetting um, around the picture. Showing the connections of people to one another and, uh, and their home, his photographs reveal a place that is both ordinary yet charged, where daily events are infused with mystery and myth. In the early 1980s, um, as, as Sally Mann wrote in the uh, odd hours between jobs and diapers, uh, she began to merge the emotional insight of Gowan with the cool-eyed precision of Ansel Adams in a series of photographs of young girls on the cusp between childhood and adulthood. She published these pictures in 1988 in a book titled At 12 and interspersed them with short descriptive texts that reveal how carefully she staged the pictures. Although many have an air of spontaneity as if they were snapshots made with a small handheld camera, all were made with her, with her cumbersome 8 by 10 inch camera better suited to photographing rocks and trees than the fluid movements uh, and fleeting expression of a child. Many show the budding sexuality of the girls and present them in coming, as coming to terms with their femininity and womanhood. One depicts um, man's friend Leslie, her naked pregnant body um, protruding like a giant water balloon ready to burst as she stands in the oppressive humidity of a Virginia summer, wearing an expression, as Mann wrote, of resignation, ambivalence, and determination Leslie leans back on an abandoned washing machine as if signaling the hours of drudgery that lie ahead while her daughter wraps her arms and legs around her mother. Looking directly at the camera, she has a startling air of empathy and sadness, perhaps in recognition of her own past and future. With these carefully constructed, unflinchingly seen pictures, At 12 reads like a collection of finely honed stories, short stories, replete with details and ambiguity, questions posed and left unanswered. Each photograph, like a short story, focuses on a self-contained moment or incident in a child's life 
and provides a glimpse into another country. As the great writer and short story writer John Updike wrote of the, of the genre, as he continued, an occasion for surprise, an excuse for wisdom, and an argument for charity. It's often said that short stories are apprenticeships for authors, a genre they must master before moving on to longer, more ambitious and experimental narratives. Mann made that leap in 1984 when she began to photograph her children and constructed a grand narrative titled Immediate Family that was as ambitious and accomplished as it was controversial. The story it tells is a layered one, though fundamentally um, it is about a specific place. The family's 400-acre farm nestled in a, short shoot, in a horseshoe bend on the Maori River outside of Lexington. Mann's first words in, in immediate family, her introduction, signal the importance of the place. She wrote, the place is important. The time is summer. It's any summer. But the place is home, and the people are my family. The story is also about the Edenic life the family enjoyed there, the long days spent swimming, playing, and being together with no electricity, imagine that, um, the, this day and age, no running water, and far removed from the intrusions of late 20th century life. And the story is also about man's own history with the place. It's about her father who bought the land and built the cabin, and her mother and grandmother, Jessie, who made the Easter dress that man's own daughter, named Jessie, proudly displayed on one spring morning. And it is about the oppressive heat of the place, but with its refugent light and its pristine, timeless, what natural beauty. Abandoning the treacly uh, stereotypes of childhood that had characterized fine art photographs of children before her, man transformed the intimate and the everyday into extraordinary moments. Jesse on the verge of a dive, or Larry in Virginia napping. Yet most, but not all, most of the photographs were not taken with a small handheld camera as is so typical of most family pictures, um, but with this large 8 by 10 inch camera, which you can see Sally here um, balancing on her hip. Um, it's, an 8 by 10 inch camera is almost always used on a tripod. Sally did try to hand hold the 8 by 10 um, at times. Um, but many of the pictures, though, are also the fruit of very careful planning and tightly controlled execution. Skirting the border between fact and fiction, the real and the imagined, this photograph, for example, seems to document the raw aftermath of a clash between a defiant Jesse who's adorned with war paint um, and an unseen adult whose arm bears fresh teeth marks. But Mann made the teeth marks on her own arm, and she and Jesse expertly recreated her sullen expression for the camera. Through this artifice, the picture convincingly expresses the fundamental childhood struggle between the need for independence and the desire for connection. Mann conceived of some of the photographs, but others were suggested by the children. As she explained, Sometimes I have an idea, usually based on something I have seen them do. When it's convenient, I'll arrange the scene and work. Th the kids will work back into it. The final image, more often than not, is significantly affected by the children's interpretations or contributions. Some are gifts to me from my children, gifts that come in a moment as fleeting as the touch of an angel's wing. You can see that man is an extraordinary writer. The angels did grace many of these photographs, for they are as sure and telling, as layered and nuanced as the greatest pictures of domestic life, revealing man's extraordinary ability to infuse the everyday with mythic significance. While many present the world from a child's point of view, such as the pure ecstatic delight siblings have in mastering a delicate balancing act in the warm sunlight, 
but others express those emotions that, are, that reside more exclusively with parents. The alligator's approach, for example, speaks of every parent's dread of imminent unforeseen danger and the need to be constantly vigilant, uh, even in paradise. While Emmett floating broaches the unspeakable horror of the death of a child. The very strength and emotional honesty of these, these photographs and the conflicted feelings they provoke in viewers from aching love fear and protectiveness to the beguiling, even alluring nature of the children themselves shake many viewers to the core, as they did Man herself. She wrote, the more I look at the life of the children, the more enigmatic and fraught with danger and loss their lives become. Yet it is without question Man's inclusion of nude photographs of her children that has elicited the most discussion. She was hardly the first fine art photographer to do this, from Julia Margaret Cameron uh, to Edward Weston and Emmett Gowan. There is a rich tradition of photographers depicting nude children and more broadly of the subject of childhood. Yet few photographers before or since man have made such a nuanced, multifaceted multi uh, portrait of childhood. Few have so successfully transformed their pictures into visual metaphors that address life's grand themes, and few have released their pictures at a worse time. In 1992, the year that Mann published Immediate Family, the conservative commentator Patrick Buchanan popularized the term the culture wars, declaring that they were a battle for the soul of America. In the wake of the tumultuous changes that had occurred in American society since the 1960s, the culture wars were a battle about abortion, affirmative action, creationism, evolution, feminism, homosexuality, and school prayer. But the arts and the question of censorship, pornography, uh, and the government support of the arts were front and center. In 1989, conservatives such as Jesse Helms were enraged when Andres Serrano's portrait or photograph of a crucifix suspended in urine titled Piss Christ was exhibited at an institution that had awarded Serrano a grant using funds from the National Endowment for the Arts. And that same year, of course, the Corcoran Gallery uh, in Washington ignited a firestorm and it canceled an exhibition of Robert Maplethorpe's photographs that some thought were pornographic. While Sally Mann was swept up into this maelstrom, its reception was also clouded by several highly publicized cases of child sexual abuse, including the McMartin Preschool uh, a, a case in Manhattan, California. The rising number of cases of child abuse may be seen as symptomatic of anxieties provoked by the changing role of women, their growing presence in the workplace, and the need for better child care. Many in the art world came to man's defense, praising the beauty and originality of the photographs, as did the children themselves, who steadfastly supported them both then and now. But the inclusion of nude photographs and the exploration of childhood's complexity raised challenging questions concerning parental authority and artistic freedom. In the years since, as the panic over the depiction of nude children has subsided somewhat, immediate family came to be seen um, as one of the most revelatory uh, depictions of childhood ever produced. Yet the book has never completely lost the mantle of controversy as the questions it raises about privacy and exploitation um, uh, and the distinction between public and private images has taken on a new significance as the unregulated traffic uh, in images is far more extensive now in the digital age than anyone could possibly have imagined 25 years ago. So in the early 1990s, um, as the critics both praised and condemned immediate family, Mann 
slowly turned away from photographing her children and began to depict the rivers, rolling hills, um, and forests nearing, near her home in Lexington. Using the soft vignetting um, of uh, her, her camera, she created pictures um, such as blue hills that seem as if she's standing on a rise, sort of hand cupped um, against her forehead as she surveys the scene that unfolds before her eyes. Often she photographed um, in the early morning or late afternoon when the lang landscape was dripping with humidity, infusing her pictures with a luminous, languid sense and a profound mystery and even longing. At the same time, she renewed her friendship with the painter, sculptor, and photographer Cy Twombly, who was a native of Lexington, Virginia, and who returned there from Rome for several months each year. Inspired by his softly focused photographs of inconsequential things, flowers, the corner of his studio, light coming in from a window, she too searched for scenes that were uncompelling, as she said. She discovered that, that views such as this one could be surprisingly seductive and noted, these are the places and things most of us drive by unseeing, scenes of southern dejection we'd contemplate only if our car broke down and left us by the verdant roadside. Seeking to capture what she called the radical light of the South, she also looked back to the work of the 19th century Lexington, Virginia photographer Michael Miley, whose pictures of the Virginia countryside revealed to her new ways to articulate light, form, and space, and showed her the potential of a less than perfect negative. Although her early family pictures had required a technique that she said had to be so precise to out Ansel the most meticulous Adams, great description, um, she now boldly experimented using her eight by 10 inch camera and faulty lenses and high contrast ortho film. Because ortho film could be developed um, while illuminated with a safe light, she was able to see the negative emerging in the developing solution, which would allow her to over or under develop it, um, and even to add drips of other chemicals that might not belong in there to create unusual effects. So to sort of intensify the, the sense of a scene that's sort of emerging be, um, before our eyes. Later in the 1990s, when Mann ventured to Georgia, Alabama, Louisiana, and Mississippi, she absorbed the region's poverty and inequality, as well as the sense of oppression, pain, loss, decay, and even death that seemed to permeate the very air. The Deep South, she wrote, was haunted by the souls of the millions of African Americans who built that part of the country with their hands and with the sweat and blood of their backs. Seeking to explore this idea that the land could be a container for memory, she sought, as she also wrote, to get the earth to give up its ghosts. She lingered in particular um, near Money, Mississippi, the town where 14-year-old Emmett Till, an African-American from Chicago, was kidnapped and murdered in 1955 after he was wrongfully accused of flirting with a white woman. Like so many others, Mann had been haunted by the accounts of his death that she'd heard since her childhood and had named her first-born son, her only son, Emmett, in honor of him. On this tr trip, she retraced Till's route on the evening of his death, creating several photographs in homage to him. One, this one, the, the bridge on the Tallahassee, depicts the bridge um, that many people thought was where Till's naked and mutilated body was thrown into the river, weighted down by the heavy fan from a cotton gin showing a picturesque bridge nestled in the background and spanning a placid river. It's the kind of scene that might adorn the walls of the local chamber of commerce. Yet in the foreground, this skeletal branch 
reaches in from the left like the scrawny fingered hand of death and just below it there's a seemingly casual drip um, uh, on the negative that evokes a sense of a teardrop moving through the emulsion. At once ordinary but charged, beautiful but horrific, the image embodies the very paradox of the South itself. Guided by a friend, man then trekked through the dense underbrush to the site where they believed Till's body was pulled from the Tallahatchie. When she got there, she wrote that she was disappointed by the humdrum backwashy scene before her. She wrote, how could a place so weighted with historical pain appear so ordinary? Positioning her camera directly in front of a gash in the, in the earth um, she focused um, on that open sort of wound-like form to depict a place that seemed as barren and as devoid of humanity in 1998 as it had been in 1955. But she also shot into the sun, allowing it to fill the heinous scene with light, perhaps mindful of Martin Luther King's admonition Darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. Mann further explored the violent histories that lay beneath the alluring beauty of the southern landscape in a series of photographs of Civil War battlefields made between 2000 and 2003. As she reflected on the history of her nat native land, she asked, does the earth remember? Do these fields upon which unspeakable carnage occurred, where unknowable numbers of bodies are buried, bear witness to in some way? Is there a numinous sense of death in these now placid battlefields, these places of stilled time? As she sought to answer this question, she made a series of photographs in what she called the scrubby off orphan corners of battle, the battlefields at Antietam, Fredericksburg, and Manassas, and several others that were in a stone's throw um, of her home in Lexington. And she came to believe that the only way to convey the latent energy that lingers in a site charged with historical suffering was not through fact, but fiction. Although she made her photographs during the bright light of the day under the hot sun, often surrounded by busloads of tourists, her pictures present no evidence of the present or even the ordinary. Instead, their dark, ominous tones suggest that they were taken in the twilight hours or during conflagrations so horrendous that the light of the sun was all but obliterated. She positioned her camera close to the ground, tilted it to capture a high horizon line, and selectively focused on one spot in the composition, um, a picket fence, um, as you see here in the Battle um, of Antietam, or a stand of corn, as you see here um, in cornfields from Antietam. These devices help draw the, the viewer into the composition, giving them points of reference around which to decipher the scene, but they also suggest the things a soldier might have seen before closing his eyes for the last time. She also fully exploited the potential of her technique to impart meaning to the scene. Like many Civil War photographers themselves, she began to use the 19th century wet collodion process to create her negatives. It required, and here you see um, Sally coating a glass plate with um, collodion um, in her uh, darkroom. And it requires the photographer to coat the plate with collodion, which is like a, a syrupy, sticky substance, then dip it into a solution of silver salts, which combine with the collodion to make it light sensitive. The plate then must be uh, loaded into the camera, exposed and developed all before the collodion has a chance to dry. But unlike her 19th century predecessors who sought to create pristine negatives, man readily embraced the flaws in hers, the scratches, the pits, the peeling um, emulsions, the riptides of collodion that she got from coating it unevenly. 
because she felt that this casual handling of the collodion added metaphorical resonance to her pictures. Striving to conjure the immensity of the bloody tragic conflict, she cultivated what she called the angel of uncertainty, praying with each exposure as she said, please don't let me screw it up, but still, if I do, screw it up enough to make it interesting. <laughs> Digging sort of deeply into the expressive power of her, of her technique, she sought not only what was seen, um, but what was invisible and felt, those intangible, ineffable traces of emotion and experience that linger in the land. She used, as I said, these riptides of, of collodion um, to, uh, to create a sense of an inferno tearing through the sky uh, at Fredericksburg, rendering heaven and earth, but also expressing the pain that seemed to be forever exuding from these tormented place. Uh, in some, bullets seem to fly through the air, while in others, shrapnel rains down as if the conflict um, still reigned. In all of these pictures, she pushes her technique to the limits of legibility, and her compositions become more abstract, painterly, and darker than they ever had been before, sort of lodging deep in one's memory like half-forgotten dreams whose meaning and resonance must be extracted. But they also shed the characteristics usually associated with photographs, becoming less literal and descriptive and didactic, less connected to reality as it's usually seen, and less rooted in a specific time. These elements combine to create photographs with an otherworldly presence. And she intensified this spectral presence when she published several of them in her 2003 book, What Remains, by pairing some of the pictures with lines from an elegy written by Walt Whitman at the end of the war, where he implored, absorb them well, O my earth, she cried. I charge you, lose not my sons, lose not an atom. A few years later, Mann embarked on a period of intense self-examination and began to consider how race, history, and the social injustice, the social structure of Virginia had shaped not only the landscape, but also her own childhood and adolescence. Striving to reach across what she called the seemingly untraversable divide between the races, she wanted to address the rivers of blood, as she had written, African Americans had poured into the land, as well as the courage they had displayed and the journeys they had taken as they sought to escape slavery. She did this by creating four groups of pictures. Two addressed the physical and spiritual pathways, the rivers and swamps that offered slaves potential escape routes to freedom, but just as often brought them death, felled by panthers, venomous snakes, um, and slave catchers themselves, and the churches that promised spiritual deliverance. And she made two, a series of photographs that depict African Americans themselves, men who modeled for man, and the one African American she knew best, Virginia Gigi Carter, who had worked for man's parents for more than 50 years and who was a defining presence in her life. In 2008, she began to look at the landscape as a story of oppression and the struggle for freedom and photographed in the Great Dismal Swamp and along the nearby Blackwater and Nottoway Rivers in Southampton County in Virginia. She had long been fascinated with Nat Turner, who she knew lived near these rivers when he led a slave rebellion in 1831 with brutal consequences. More than 15, 50 white Virginians were killed and 56 African Americans were executed, including Turner himself, who was hanged, flayed, and beheaded, while more than 100 other enslaved people died at the hands of vigilantes. Making tintypes, which are essentially uh, collodion positives on lacquered metal sheets, Mann created pictures of a dark, impenetrable world. In several, she uses the mirroring of trees, vines, and brush to intertwine reality and reflection so much that it's nearly impossible to distinguish which and which. 
Other pictures have tumultuous skies with spindly or shattered trees and desolate bogs that look as if a holocaust had just ravaged the area. Fully merging her, her technique with her, its metaphorical possibilities, she added to this sense of, of conflagration and horror by overexposing her tintypes and allowing their highlights to solarize or, or reverse tone and also create this unnatural metallic gray. And some, as you can see here, are edged with this eerie, um, uh, wavering, incandescent blue line, which was probably caused by excessive collodion along the edge of her plate, um, but that adds to this other world worldliness. It may also refer to the bluish green sun that Nat Turner saw during a solar eclipse the week before he began the uprising, and that he interpreted as God's validation of his mission to free enslaved people. All of these pictures present a world so horrific that only the most desperate and brave would dare to enter. At the same time, Mann also began to photograph African-American churches. After Turner's rebellion in 1831, Virginia passed a law requiring that African-American congregations could only meet in the presence of a white person. Thus, after the Civil War, numerous all-black churches were constructed throughout the South, some very large in big cities, but others small um, with eight, 10, 20 members of their congregations, but all became the font of African-American life. When Mann began to make these photographs, she discovered that some were still active, uh, such as this, this one, the Belula Baptist um, Church in Stewart's dra draft, which was right near her, while others had no living members. She photographed them all again with her eight by 10 inch camera, but this time using collodion, uh, not using collodion um, film, but with ortho film. And she presents them as glowing abstract forms. They are alive with the spirit that inspired their creation and the memories of those who worshiped there recalling the hush or brush arbors where slaves had worshiped in the antebellum south, she depicted some surrounded by overgrown trees and brushes um, at one with nature, while others vibrate with an inner energy, um, their paint, their windows sparkling um, and glowing, and still more seem uh, as if they've been captured at the very moment almost of, of evanescing and being assumed into the heavens. She printed them on expired photographic paper toned with tea, and they take on a wide variety um, of colors from light orange, as you saw back here, um, to eggshell, to cool silver, as individual as the structures themselves. Hidden in plain sight, these churches mark what Toni Morrison called benches those places where you or I, as Morrison wrote, can go to think about or not think about, to summon the presence of or recollect the absence of slaves. And all convey the ecstatic moment that, that Sally Mann wrote about in her memoir, Hold Still, of going to church with Virginia Gigi Carter. As she wrote, when the congregation was in full throat, I felt as if a great wave had picked me up and was rolling me over. I went with it, tumbling like a pale piece of ocean glass, washing up outside the heavy doors at the end of the service. Blinking in the sudden sunshine of Main Street, I reached for Gigi's hand. But man at this time also looked at the way the region was not only marked physically and spiritually by race, but also how race had shaped the most intimate bonds within her family. In particular, she looked back to her relationship with Virginia Gigi Carter, someone who she loved unreservedly. But now as an adult, she saw ever more clearly that while her parents and her brother Chris had worked hard in support of the civil rights movement, 
the family had benefited from a social and legal structure that had perpetuated the subjugation of African Americans and allowed someone like Gigi to work 12-hour days, six days a week for minimal pay while simultaneously denying her basic human rights. Wrestling with her own complicity, as she wrote, for all that I had not seen, had not known, had not asked, she insisted that she and her family did not take Gigi for granted. She wrote, we knew even then that her love was re the real stuff that held our family together. But nevertheless, she was haunted by, as she said, the stunningly unexamined way they had conducted their lives. She continued, what were any of us thinking? Why did we never ask the questions? That's the mystery of it our blindness and our silence. Seeking to more fully understand this woman who had been a defining presence in her life, Mann reached out to Gigi's children and grandchildren to learn their own memories of what Sally called the best mother a child could want. Gigi um, was the daughter um, of, was the granddaughter of a former slave and the daughter of a woman who was most likely raped by a white man. Um, and Gigi had died in 1994 at age 100. Mann recalled Gigi's physical presence, her, describing her as a proud, um, powerful, and com com composed woman. While vivid memories came flooding back to her of Gigi's inability to find shoes that fit her size 13 feet, the fact that she wore um, man's mother's old stockings, and as, as Sally wrote, whose gossamer runs enlarged into ladder rungs as the day went on, the seams wobbling crazy, and also um, who wore her father's discarded shoes, which had to be razor sliced to accommodate the corns on her toes. These pictures took on new meaning and poignancy as Mann, now in her 60s, more fully understood the toll that life takes on the body and spirit. And she also looked back to a series of photographs that she had taken of Gigi and her own daughter, Virginia, whom she had named after Gigi um, in the late 1980s and early 1990s. This one depicts Virginia asleep on Gigi's lap, um, in a, both in a deep sleep. Merging age and youth, past and present, man wove the picture together to the depiction of the long tendrils of Gigi's hair and both of their upraised um, arms, um, which seemed to suggest as, as if both of them were in their sleep singing hallelujah. But Mann also looked to the lessons Gigi had taught her about her own conflict within the harsh realities of race relations of the South in the 1950s and 60s, and now saw them too in a new light. She recalled one incident in particular when um, as a newly minted driver, well, in, when she was a teenager, she had nonchalantly picked up a young black man um, outside of Lexington and driven him into town. When she got home, she casually told Gigi about this. And as she wrote in Hold Still, I went on and Gigi was listening, but then she was turning her body toward me with an ominous heaviness, as if a Henry Moore sculpture were being rotated 180 degrees. She had biscuit dough stuck to her hands, but above those hands was that wide face, shiny with sweat, and was it anger? Anger at me? No, perhaps it was fear, but there was also anger, and it was taking over her features in a way I had never seen before. With her hands in the air, the way a surgeon holds them to push the paddle faucets when he is prepped for action, she pushed me against the wall with her flowery forearms, and in a voice I'd never heard, low and afraid, she said, don't you ever pick up a colored boy again, no matter what, no matter who, you hear me? 
Although initially, as Mann admitted in her memoir, she was so self-centered, as she wrote, that she thought Gigi's concerns were only for her. Years later, she recognized that it was unclear just which of us Gigi was most worried about. Mann also explored another unspoken but trenchant racial division that had marked her youth and shaped her interactions. African-American men whom she, as she wrote, never really saw, never really knew. She made her first attempts to photograph African-American men in 2006, hiring law students, kitchen workers, or laborers to model for her. But the project really gained steam in 2009 when she saw um, the choreographer Bill T. Jones's production of Fondly Do We Hope, Fervently Do We Pray, which was a, a groundbreaking work that reflected on the legacy of Abraham Lincoln. Mann, in particular, was struck by how Jones celebrated the power and beauty of the African-American male body, even as he lamented and condemned the histories of racism and slavery that have subjected it to so much stereotype and projection. Inspired by this idea, Mann sought to make pictures that simultaneously acknowledge this divide and invite connection opening a doorway, as she said, that leads from an immutable past to a future that Gigi and I would never have imagined. As she tried to reconcile her love for the South with its brutal history, she endeavored to create photographs that attended to the nuances of individual men, but are also, also aesthetically resonant um, in some universal way. She wrote, when I work with these men, my goal was to establish such a level of trust as to suspend, if only for that short time, our racial past. Reflecting on the histories of oppression and struggle that continue to impact the experience of many African Americans and people of color, she sought, as she wrote, to catch the ghosts and see the traces of all those who lived and died. Both beautiful yet challenging, these photographs seem to slip in and out of time, using 19th century processes to raise contemporary issues, even as they remain deliberately ambiguous. Mann titled the series as a whole, Abide With Me, weaving together the pictures of swamps, churches, Gigi, and the men like a long elegiac poem with deep passages of lament and sorrow and solace. She infused them with a sense of penitence, empathy, and faith, with a recognition of a long, complicated history and the need to construct a better future. The title draws on the various uses of the word abide. She observed that while it means to accept and remain steadfast, it's also frequently used in the negative as in I cannot abide you and to suggest an inability to tolerate. But abide with me also draws on the Christian hymn of the same title, a prayer to God to remain present throughout life's trials um, as well as in death. Begun at the dawn of Barack Obama's presidency when the possibility of racial recon reconciling and reconciliation seemed more than a distant dream and completed in the wake of the killings and racial unrests in Ferguson, Baltimore, Dallas, Charleston, Charlottesville, and too many other cities and towns across the country, the series Abide With Me is not only an elegy to 400 years of cruelty and, and intolerance, but also a very personal cry from one, from one artist for greater understanding and compassion for a better future. At the same time, Mann was also creating the pictures in Abide With Me. She was making a series that reflect on mortality, aging, and life's fragility. In 2004, she created several haunting close-ups of the faces of her now uh, grown children and printed them in a startlingly large 40 by 50 inch size. Yet it is her photographs of her husband that most evocatively reveal her continuing uh, desire to merge photography and literature. She titled the series of pictures Proud Flesh, a term 
uh, that's used for the scar tissue that forms over the wounds of horses. Although she'd photographed Larry regularly since they met in 1969, in the early 2000s, uh, she trained her camera on him again, reflecting the, in, the, the ravages of muscular dystrophy on his body. Now, the 20th century is rich with male photographers who have photographed their spouses or significant others, from Stieglitz and Weston to Callahan and Gowan, and McGowan, but few female photographers before man have done so. Painfully honest, yet tender, the pictures are ultimately, I think, a testament to the strength of their love and to Larry's unwavering support of her art. Man's titles speak of both that love and also a profound sense of loss, and once again reveal her desire to write with her photographs. Although throughout her career, she had mainly used descriptive titles like Battlefields, Antietam, Black Sun, those that she uses for these pictures of Larry are often drawn from literary and artistic sources. Seemingly mer seem seamlessly merging her imagery with the rich aphorisms of some of her favorite literary heroes from T.S. Eliot and Ezra Pound to Eudora Welty and Greek mythology, Mann expresses her deep love for her husband in this series of photographs. Um, this one, for example, is titled um, Memory's Truth, is from a, a story by Salman Rush, Rushdie about a child endowed with special, special powers. Well, this one, Hephaestus, um, uh, in it, Sally connects Hephaest Larry to Hephaestus. Um, Hephaestus was um, the Greek god of metalworking, and Larry is not only a lawyer, um, but also um, a blacksmith. Now, Asbestos was expelled from Mount Olympus, the home of the gods, because of a physical dis dis deformity. And while the cracking that she has here in her um, collodion negative and the molten swirls um, allude to the art um, of, uh, of metal working, um, you can see um, Larry's body sort of literally um, um, uh, uh, decaying before our eyes. Others, like this one, Ponder Heart, use the title of Eudora Welty's short story, which is a story about a generous man who gives away all that he has. Uh, like Others, like this one, allude to Larry's character. We end our exhibition with man's photograph, The Turn. Again, it shows her husband, Larry, who is turning to survey a field of grass that they had lit in a controlled burn to clean out the field and prepare it for new life. With its suggestion of the cyclical nature of all life and its depiction of the man and land around which Sally Mann herself had devoted her life, it eloquently shows how she has spent more than 40 years, as she wrote, composing silver poems of tone and undertow, poem photographs that are heady with, beautiful, with beauty and ponderous with loss. Thank you.